Here we go. So we are <laughs> live and I'm happy to be um, having a little TMS symptoms of number one, a little bit m messing up on the date and the time because Dr. Bethany Rains is in America, Central Time, USA, and it's August 14th, nighttime for her. And it's morning for me. And Rose will join us a minute in a minute from Australia. So we are really global. And through this global network that all of us have been creating, really kind of due to COVID, to COVID and kind of like the gift of COVID, was finding the gift. Um, we are able to be international with amazing people on uh, this in the studio. So my name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. I'm streaming live from Israel. Um, you guys all know who I am. I don't need to talk about me. Rose will be joining us in a minute. We're here to welcome Dr. Bethany Rains. I just connected with you. Ah, here's Rose. Yay, yay. Okay, Rose is ready. So I'm, just <laughs> happy. I'm so happy you're here. So I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay, Rose. Sorry, I had to go, go and grab a bite to eat. You had to go grab a what? Anyway, we're live. Welcome. You I realized do, that. Yes. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> know you've gone live. Rains now. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Yeah. I feel like exactly. this is all just like a phenomenal setup for the conversation we're about to have. It's just, it's almost like I feel like a little bit. If I, if I didn't trust you guys, I think you'd planned it just to like have it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hey, Rose, well, let's introduce, start. Introduce Bethany. <laughs> introduce Dr. Rains. Uh, haven't, haven't you done that yet? I did, but I was in the middle of it, and you're so good at it. <laughs> you see how Tova takes me by surprise, and then I <laughs> and then I go flat. Just notice that as a patient. <laughs> notice that you're actually seeing something live in in that because I've come in not knowing what the previous conversation was. And then I've been invited to actually do my bit, but I don't know what's happening. So I go flat. And if you see that in, from a vasovagal point of view, I've shut down. So just notice when that happens to you, folks that are going to be watching this. So just, and welcome, Bethany. I didn't realize that uh, that you'd started, that you're on air. Uh, <laughs> yes, I thought this was going to be tomorrow and not today. <laughs> So, I, yes, Toba was just explaining. We're we're all across like a ridiculous amount of time zones at this point that we've crossed the the yeah. actual the yeah. state line. Yeah. <laughs> now I know you and Toba want to talk about uh, emotions and pain being the same thing, but mm -hmm. I also I'm not comfortable with that in actual fact. But we'll oh. find out. But you'll be able to explain to me why I'm not comfortable with it. But I also want to actually, my my desire, the greatest desire is for us to talk about why it's so hard for people to self-reflect. Mm. And and that's one of the most important things as, as a therapist, I find that helping the patient to be scaffolded so that they can self-reflect. And I'll, I'd, I'd like you to draw something of your knowledge into that so that people cannot accuse themselves of not being adequate because that's what happens the the accusatory thing and i actually have come up with this new idea of calling that self-criticism their their greek chorus as i google I like that i, I googled <laughs> it and there's these forms in orange and with, with their formless faces and there's a whole chorus and if you think about shakespeare you know, there's always this chorus in the background lamenting or, you know, so, yeah, so I, I'd really like that. And, of course, for me as an ISTP therapist, I would link that to childhood trauma and ACEs, that's inability to self-reflect because self-reflection will create blame and the child is always trying to defend themselves. So if you can actually draw that out, from a neuroscientist point of view, so that our our viewers will get an understanding that their self-criticism is coming from a defensive mode 
rather than, than you know, um, a mode that sort of um, they see it as, you know, they're self-attacking, but it's to defend themselves against the person that didn't uh, see them in a loving light, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So, sorry, yeah. Bethany, I've just delivered <laughs> no, this. it's definitely I was totally... an emotion because it's definitely no. going to cause, it's going to cause, you know, the, the body to go on fight or flight mechanism and it will cause chronic pain or anxiety. So you're, we're right on, to, we're right on topic. Honestly, yeah, actually the neuroscience of both topics is very similar. Um, yeah, I realize so, that, but uh, we need yeah. to actually hone in so that the patient understands. Because when you say pain, pain is an emotion, well, is why would pain be an emotion or mm -hmm. is it that it comes from the same part of the brain to block the emotion that would be how i'd see it so, so the, the best way to stop the emotion coming out. yeah um so i think the best way to explain it um is kind of just explain what an emotion is from a neuroscience definition mm -hmm. um and i think what a lot of people have learned is a traditional theory it's an older theory and it's what we sometimes call discrete emotions that we have these basic emotions as humans and that there's like a center in the brain that activates them and people experience them similarly and there's shared characteristics and there's a neural circuit that's sort of responsible for turning it on and off right like mm -hmm. an anger circuit or um, and Paul Ekman, right, was a very famous scientist who proposed that. And it's what most people learn in school. Um, there's six of those basic emotions. You guys have probably seen them in textbooks where it's like joy and disgust and anger. Um, so that was how we saw emotions for many years, decades. And um, more recently, as we've been able to get a lot more technology about how the brain works, that's actually really shifted pretty rapidly um, it started about 20 years ago and has really kind of been picking up more and more steam because the new theory uh, is a little bit easier to support. So one of the issues with Ekman's theory, uh, I shouldn't even call it Ekman's theory necessarily, it's a, but that discrete emotional idea is that it set off this race for people to find those centers and to find what we call emotional fingerprints. So what are the fingerprints we can measure to know somebody is angry every time? And how do we objectively know somebody is happy every time? People have tried everything. They've tried fMRIs. They've tried tone of voice. They've tried facial expressions. And there just isn't a consistent fingerprint for any emotion. And the reason for that is because emotions are not discrete in that way. Emotions are actually a much more constructive thing. So the new um, kind of more modern theory that neuroscientists use for emotion was uh, brought up by somebody named Lisa Feldman Barrett. And frankly, I think she is like the coolest scientist, by the way. <laughs> um, well, Tova, Tova would, would you write that on the sidebar? Yeah. So anyone yes. who's interested in this can follow this up themselves. And she's got an amazing book. Us. Yes, her book, she has this great book and it's written for people, even if you don't have a neuroscience background, called How Emotions Are Made. And her name again is Lisa Feldman Barrett. I'll write it in a minute. Um, Good, yeah. fantastic. And so she explains all of this, but um, essentially what it is, we've learned that the brain doesn't react. So one of the problems with the discrete emotions is this idea that you're living your life, something comes along, it triggers, let's say anger, your brain activates the anger circuit and you have anger very reactive, right? Uh, the brain actually predicts much more than it reacts. So that doesn't work as well with this predictive model that we've seen again and again as we've gotten more sophisticated with the brain. What we see now is that emotions are not a discrete thing. They're not a thing your brain necessarily does. They're just the lived experience of uh -huh. your brain making sense of a lot of sensory information. What our brains do when we have lots of data coming in all the time is it compiles it into what we usually call concepts, right? And that's a pretty universal term. It's what it sounds like. A concept is your idea of a pattern of sensory data and you've given it a name so that you don't have to think of it in a hundred different physical ways. You can just think like, for example, if I say bear, you're very likely to have very similar 
sensory ideas of what that is, as opposed to me sitting there being like, well, it's a large animal about, you know, a thousand pounds with brown hair and round ears, right? Like all those things would be a lot. And if your brain was always trying to think of things in their direct sensory data, it would just explode. <laughs> you wouldn't be very efficient at all. So emotions are a type of concept. And what they are is as you live your life, you're not born with basic emotion. That is actually not something we've seen any evidence for. But what we do have are patterns that are very similar, especially within cultures and families, where you will experience an external stimulus, something in your environment, and it makes you feel a certain way, right? It's rewarding or it's threatening. Um, it causes you harm. It, it damages you or it makes you better. Um, and you remember that. And then in the future, you have a concept for that emotional cue. And that just grows and grows and grows your hey, whole life. Bethany, can we yeah. hold it for a moment? What yeah. you just said is exactly about ACEs. You know, yep. our patients don't recognize that they've had an early trauma because it's often so subtle. So yeah. they're not, and they've also put it out of mind, yep. the actual trauma. Would yep. you mind now repeating what you just said about sure. how the preemptive text in our heads set us up? Actually, so, that's yeah. what I wanted to write about when yeah. I, the, I wanted to, that was my theme I was going to use about preemptive text. But okay. because of our time change, I didn't get around to doing it. But that's oh, what no actually happens in the brain, isn't it? We set up yes. this thing has happened to us at a certain stage in our lives. And in actual fact, we can tell, um, and maybe a neuroscientist can tell even better than a therapist, what when that actually happened in the small brain as well. Possibly. Possibly, yeah. yeah. But, it, you know, especially early on, this is why ACEs are so critically important, is because you're still making those concepts for yourself. Yeah. And one of the most important aspects of a concept is, is this normal? Is this expected? Is this a common outcome, right, in my life? So are is this a consistent concept where it always leads to this? And when you're little and you don't have a lot of experiences, it doesn't take a large number of things to kind of make it seem consistent, right? Like exactly. if you've done it a million times, if it's only happened three times, well then you can kind of disregard it. But when you're young and you've only experienced it three times, if it happened all three times, you've got a 100% batting average, right? So, exactly. so it can be a really strong concept. So yeah. so those concepts, um, yeah, we, we just start to normalize them, automate them. They become very automatic, right? Because I, like I said, if I say bear, all of you, think of what you think of a bear. It's like the trick, right? Don't think of a pink elephant, right? <laughs> we, you're thinking of elephant. Um, we all have a concept of pink, we all have a concept of elephants. For people who are traumatized, they have a concept of, of something in their environment being dangerous, being a threat because it hurt them when they were younger. And especially if it happens multiple times, then it's a thing that's always harmful. Um, emotions are the same thing. We just use them to categorize a lot of the internal sensations that we have. So your body has got your external sense of touch, right? We think of that all the time. You can feel things, they're smooth, furry, whatever. Um, you also have a sense of touch inside your body and it's called interoception. And it's actually very big, it's very broad. And it's really mostly based on something we call affect, which is just kind of like good and bad feelings on one axis and strong and weak feelings on the other axis. Pretty basic stuff. Uh, that's on purpose. Because imagine your day if you could feel your spleen. You know, it would be very distracting. <laughs> so you just feel good or bad and feel really good or really bad. And we have words for some of them, like I have a pit in my stomach, or you can feel your heart racing, right? You have clammy palms. We have a lot of words for those things, but for the whole, for the most part, we kind of group them in very broad ways. So that's kind of where emotion concepts come in. When you're young, you start to take those broad emotion concepts and most kids learn them fairly um, kind of didactic, right? Like, oh, what does sad look like? What does sad feel like? Um, how what come, does let, me, let, me stop, let me just stop you for, if I may interrupt. How, yeah. When we cry, when we feel sad, we cry. That's yep. a physical reaction to a feeling. Mm -hmm. When we feel scared we tense when i feel yeah. angry i uh, my heart beats so when i feel pain 
Like this is where I've been trying to understand pain is an emotion because you first okay. said it and I've been on it like like be like honey like what is this and I asked Howard Trubiner and like they, like yeah but like you explain it like they understand that pain is processed in the same part of the brain so obviously we're expressing the emotion pain um, and we're not talking about acute pain we're talking about chronic pain this is where I think we can draw what I'm want to talk about what Rose wants to talk about. And how we can help people with so, their, you know, with their their emotions and their anxiety. So maybe we can yeah. bring that to like the, the surface because I'm fascinated by that. And I tell people a lot, and I talk about it. And Rose wants to talk, Rose wants to you know decide how to come to terms with it as well. You know, from from Rose's point of view. Yeah, that's that's fine. So um, let let me draw a, an important distinction when I say pain is an emotion. There are two processes that we associate largely with pain. One is called nociception. And you guys are probably familiar with that term. If, you're, if anybody is not familiar with it, nociception is the what we call a bottom-up signal. It's your body's way of letting your brain know damage has happened. And it comes from any part of your body that's got nerves in it, which is pretty much any part of your body, right? And so um, your nerves carry special receptors and they're called nociceptors, and their whole job is to report damage or harm something that has gone wrong, right? So there's nociception. That activates parts of your brain. There are several of them. You have a network in your brain that um, we call the pain center, right? A lot of times, or pain response. Now, nociception is not your pain response. Nociception is not pain. It is a nerve signal that triggers pain. Pain is a top-down signal. Pain is something that is learned. It is something that is a little different for everyone. It can be very different from instance to instance. And if you think about an emotion as being like this collection of sensory data, feelings that you feel, and things that you associate, and then start to like, okay, this thing makes me feel this you can start to see how it's behaving in an emotion in a, very, well, in a neuroscientific way. When we talk about emotions, we're talking about that collection, those concepts, and pain can be very personal for people. And you assign it to environmental cues that your whole life you've kind of come to expect will result in pain. So one example that Howard gives a lot, <laughs> Howard Schubner gives a lot, um, is a story that I, I really like. And I think it illustrates this really well. And it's the construction worker who is out on a job and he steps on a nail, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's in excruciating pain and he goes to the hospital and he's just in horrible pain. But when they remove the boot through his toes, right? He's fine. There's, that is because there was no nociception there. Nociception is not, you know, subjective. It's an objective thing. So he never had a nociceptive issue because there was no harm to his toes, but he had a top-down pain experience. The reason that can happen is because over time, as things normalize and they become automatic for you, the external cues that you associate with internal feelings can actually cause those internal feelings to happen. So in an emotional way, that's probably easier to understand. You can think of it as a person who's always really frustrates you, that just always makes you really mad because they always say maybe like really infuriating things, right? What happens to you after you've had a few conversations with that person that consistently kind of ticks you off? What happens when you see them? What, what do you feel? You get angry. You start to feel your muscles tense. Your heart rate goes up. All of a sudden, you're having all of the nervous system sensations that you had when that sensory data was actually coming in. Now you're predicting it. Your brain has associated that person with anger, and it's getting you all set up, and it's creating the anger feelings and so this kind of gets to where Rose was saying too, what we do in this situation, particularly if it's very normalized, we don't even think about where those sensations come from. We don't even give conscious thought to them at all. We just think this guy makes me angry. That guy, <laughs> my anger is his fault, right? Or that thing's fault, it makes me angry. But in this case, that person probably didn't do anything at all except for exist, you saw them or thought of them, right? Maybe they're not even in the room with you. And it's really hard for us as human beings when something becomes normalized to, in Rose's words, self-reflect. And that is not just for anger. That's all of our emotions. And pain does the same thing. So pain is a collection of interoceptive feelings 
and we associate it with environmental cues. And now it can be activated very specifically by nociception, but it can also happen in the absence of those things. So if you think something is going to hurt you, if you think something has hurt you, your body will activate that pain response in a very real way. And it can also be activated by the emotional things that you started to associate with your pain. Um, so that's why stress, trauma, you know, threat, all of those feelings tend to activate the pain center as well, because those, those external sensations start to affect our internal sensations. And so when I say pain is an emotion, I'm not saying that there's like seven basic emotions and pain is one of them. I'm saying our emotions are this like sea of feelings. And we just put names on them, but they actually look completely different every time we experience them and we don't notice it. And then there are feelings that are almost exactly the same, but we happen to give them different names. So a great example of that one in therapy is right before you have a big experience. Um, but we were just talking, my husband's a, a musician, right? And he'll get nervous before a show, but he's a phenomenal musician and he'll know the songs so well He's been practicing them. I hear him. He knows that he plays them well, but he'll get nervous sometimes. And I'll tell him, are you nervous or are you excited because you love to play? And he thought about that the first time I said it. And he's like, oh, wow. And I'm like, nervous and excited feel almost exactly the same in your body. And you have to actually think about what's going on around you. And you actually might realize, oh, I'm not actually nervous at all. I'm really excited, <laughs> like I've been practicing and I know I sound good and I'm excited to show off on a stage. I love doing this. And it completely changed how he felt before a show. Um, and with pain, what we see a lot is people who are feeling um, anxious or scared or threatened, um, but they're, they're taking that in. For them, those things feel like pain. They feel like physical pain. They've been associated with that inner receptive sensation. Um, they're so integrated though, Rose, that you know your brain doesn't waste any energy and they just integrate very naturally. Just this is pain, these things hurt. These things hurt me. Um, it's also why a lot of times the pain that you feel will mimic an old previous injury, right? Either, whether exactly or mirroring it, or it'll be a very similar type of pain in a different part of the body. It usually mimics something you felt before um, and, it, and it'll intensify. So trying to stop and notice that. So that prediction circuit, it, it's, it's a survival skill for us. It's automatic, autonomic, <laughs> if you want to be real brainy. Um, and it's meant to be because you want it to be very efficient. You don't want that to take up a lot of energy because it keeps you alive in a lot of situations. If you're somewhere where you think a poisonous snake is in the tall grass and you're, you, hear, you hear rustling in the tall grass, you wanna just run before you even think about it, right? Like you don't wanna sit there and logically go through the motions, but we run into problems when we have things like trauma and pain. So kind of back to Rose's point, let's say you've had that, that childhood experience, it can make things, the more powerful things are, the more automatic they are. And so childhood things are deeply powerful, deeply automatic. We don't stop and think about them. But the only way you can correct a problematic prediction, a wrong prediction, um, which is like, you know, I'm going to do this thing and it's going to hurt, even though there's no reason for that, right? There's no reason for that to be the case. A lot of people have triggers, but, you know, we know that doesn't actually cause no susception. I don't, we don't understand why that's triggering pain. It's a problematic prediction. And the only way you can control it is by noticing when it's wrong. And that's really hard to do because a lot of these are set up on kind of self propelling circuits. So that's right. Yeah. It's very hard to do that. And it's really, really hard to do that if you don't remember your trauma in the traumatic example you gave, Rose. So if you don't remember what happened to you, you just know that this thing is scary to me. That's a scary thing. It's going to hurt me. You know, it's really hard to sit there and think, like, well, let me do the statistics. Like, how often has this? occurred and how often has it hurt? But that's really what you need to do. And that's what we do in things like exposure style therapies or mindfulness therapies is what we're doing is we're drawing attention to the raw sensory data without our concepts on it. So we're breaking that bear down into the brown fur, the round ears, whatever you need to do, the big teeth, breaking it into all those pieces again and really coming to 
do I need a new concept for this? Or is this something else, right? And that usually takes help because you your brain just isn't, that's not efficient. So your brain is not gonna wanna do it. It's not energy efficient. So hopefully that helps explain both of your guys' kind of interest in this is that, you know, once something gets normalized, um, it's really hard to change. And that that is the case in trauma and the Greek chorus, which I love that. Um, and that's also the case in whenever I'm saying pain is an emotion, is when I'm talking about that top-down collection of something somebody has built over time. So very personal, right? Your pain is kind of like your happiness or your anger or whatever it may be. It's personal, but it also changes from person to person every time too. You're not angry the same way every time, you're not happy the same way every time. Um, and so all of those things can be really hard to measure. And lo and behold, pain is also incredibly hard to measure because it's it tends to, to morph and change the same way our emotional states do. Mm. We've been looking for the fingerprints of pain for a long time, the same way we look for fingerprints of anger. And frankly, we've had a really hard time consistently getting those data. I've got another question in regard to that. Patients sure. will say, but when I touch, when I touch, I don't know, when I touch my pain, it hurts. Yeah. Tell me about that. Sure. Because, so they, because it, remember, it's top down. It's an yeah. old injury, so there's no inflammation here. There's no nothing, and yet when I touch it, it's painful. Yes, because any kind of text yeah, that. they've kind of come to the realization that any time it's touched, even if it's gentle touch, that that is going to cause pain. Right, like that is an environmental cue that has been associated for some reason in their experiences. Their brain and their body have decided that, like, oh yeah, touching this hurts it doesn't take so maybe it was if it was let's say it was injured before not always the case but let's say it was um you know of course you're a little tender and it hurts a little bit and maybe you kind of come to that belief over time while you have an acute injury well if you don't believe that that injury is going to heal and you're going to get better and you think like okay when I, I have a bad wrist now and when i touch it it hurts your brain is going to just okay automatic circuit if you touch my response, wrist, it hurts. Conditioned response? Yes, yeah. it's a conditioned response. So, um, so you know, and it's, it's predictive again, right? So that little touch is enough to set off a pretty intense thing in your brain because it wants you to let go of it immediately because it's, it's a so, you know, associated with a big threat and danger signal. So your brain is trying to get you off of that wrist because <laughs> it thinks that's dangerous, that's a threat. And your brain is always like trying to mm -hmm. minimize threats at all times. So. Yeah, the, the, again, no susception can be totally absent. There has to be, there can be no damage whatsoever. It can be a touch. Um, it can be, I know if I sit in this airplane for three hours, my back is going to be on fire. It's going to kill my back, right? And that can be all it takes. And you will have very real back pain. <laughs> you know, sometimes even just thinking of flying or seeing an airplane might be enough to, to twinge your back, right? So, um, you know, depending on how strong that conditioned response is over your experiences, how strong that con that concept is, um, is how powerful your your sort of physical response to it would be. Mm. You know, that brings me up to another question. And that is, mm -hmm. you know, um, there was research done about people with um, whiplash after motor car okay. accidents. Yeah. And the people in Finland, after they had a motor car accident, and apparently Finland, because I presume icy and cold and wet and that, they probably have quite a few car accidents. But they they took that group of people that they'd researched, car accidents, and found that none of them or virtually none of them had whiplash. And then they yeah. took a state in America somewhere or England or whatever. Oh, whiplash and, culture, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what's this thing about us needing to be like other people? Is that what it is? Um, it's not so much. I mean, maybe you could you could frame it that way. It's culture, so it's learned. So you can learn things through your own experience, or you learn them through other people's experience. That's what makes it kind of a really cool animal, That's, right? Yes, yes. So so people can socially sort of put an experience in your head that you don't actually have to have. We use it all the time, right? It's teaching. And in Finland, I, I want to say in that study, I've read that study before, and I want to say they didn't even have like a word for whiplash. I think they didn't even have like a shared cultural concept for the idea of whiplash. 
um, there's other studies that have been done where you can do sham whiplash, where your your neck is never moves and you're completely safe, but you're put in a situation where you believe that you, you kind of like went backwards and forwards and people in the United States will have whiplash pain, even though their neck and their head never move because we expect it. You've seen it in commercials. You've seen it in TV. You've heard about it from people you know. First thing you think of when somebody's been in a fender bender is probably them wearing a neck brace afterwards, right? Like we just, it's a shared cultural many expectation. Cultures, in many cultures it becomes you can, you know, sue the person. Who you can sue? Yeah, yeah, I always think of like, practice, right? yeah. So you think of a, a lawyer. In the same article about, you know, it's called the tail of two nails. There's the boot. But there's oh, yeah. also a story about um, this doctor did a study about soldiers and many soldiers that got injured were going to go home and they had much less reaction to their pain than the soldiers who got injured and had to stay. So there you go, socio-economical, I mean, not economical, social, cultural, um, future, predictive, what do you, you know. It's reward. Yeah, I'd, it, it I'd comes link that to attachment. I'd link that to attachment. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, because you're looking, and that's actually something really interesting too. Um, you know, when we, so we're talking about cultural learning around pain. You know, whiplash for adults is a really good example. I love that study, by the way, Rose. I'm glad you brought that up because it always kind of makes me giggle that they didn't even have a word for it there. Well, um, the other one I like is the RSI one with the computer because yeah, you know, the typewriter was like that, so there should be pain. Or, yeah. Whereas our computer, it's like that. We just use our fingers. And yet ah. all these people in their offices so have true. RSI. And in actual yeah. fact, it's more about their relationships with other people rather than the their computer, for example. Yeah. Or their relationships to work, right? Like, yeah, yeah exactly. But, which is other um, people as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, yeah, absolutely. With with um, oh attachment, uh, what I think is really interesting too, and we use this example a lot um, with children when they're really little and they're still building a concept for pain. You can actually watch them doing it because they'll fall down and they don't necessarily have damage, but they fell down. And they what do they do? Do they cry immediately? No, they look at an adult, a trusted adult. They wait to see. Yes. And they wait to see what is your reaction if you react negatively if you react fearfully then they'll start crying immediately and it'll hurt them very bad they'll feel pain right um if you just stay calm and you're like uh oh you fell and help them back up most of the time they're boop, they run off they no tears at all um you know i've i've seen it too kiddos um another kind of personal example uh kiddo who he'd never had a charlie horse before right a leg cramp but like oh, the really bad ones too that like wake you up in the middle of the night we know what they are. They do they hurt? Sure, objectively, but do they usually hurt us in a way that's like devastating? No, we kind of like work your way through it because you know what it is and you know it's harmless. He didn't know what it was, and it was unknown, and it was this new sensation, and it scared him very badly. So now we have fear going in here, and fear is a big pain booster. And he was so upset and it took a long time to calm him down, but we got him calmed down and just kind of gentle stretching and, um, you know, just calming him down, letting him know it's okay, you're fine, your leg is gonna be okay. It's just a, you know, sign you didn't drink enough water today and we used it too much. He had another one a few weeks later and I walked in on him in the other room, stretching and rubbing his leg. And I said, are you okay? And he said, oh yeah, I just have another one of those Charlie Post things. This was a child who was like, beside himself before you know and it was in just excruciating pain and this time it was like more like an adult right like oh it was really uncomfortable and he worked through it himself and he was fine because we had taught him it's okay it's not scary there's no there's nothing to be afraid of so kind of a more grown-up version but he's putting those constructs and concepts of pain together for himself and for a lot of us you know fear the unknown uncertainty they all can really make pain a lot worse because you're amped up and you're expecting something to be bad. So could I just add now? You, yeah. you said you said that it, that child is acting like an adult. Yeah. So now, how how come the adult can't do it for themselves? I want to sure. bring us back now to attachment theory and yeah. see that when the attachment is ruptured, the actual pain sensation stays back at age two or grade or age three or age six so yeah. when you when you're looking after a patient you see 
when the attachment rupture happened and that the intensity of the pain is related to that. You know, I, I just, hopefully I'm able to be obtruse enough about describing this, but I know a lady who has swollen legs, okay. who has a whole lot of inflammation all over the place. Now, it's interesting that I discovered that when she was two years old, her mother was having twins. Mm. What happens when you are having twins? You get very big. You can't really move around very much. You have to stay quiet and spend time on the couch. And as you move around, your legs get swollen because of the weight of the uterus on, on your um, venous system. This patient has now got all the symptoms of someone being pregnant with twins, but she can't see it yet. So yeah. this is what I'm dealing with. This person who has all these symptoms in her body as a 30 year old, but she's not pregnant. Yeah. And she's not having twins, but she's got all the symptoms. So therefore, when you go back to when she was two and the mum was pregnant and she's sitting on the couch with the swollen legs. Now, when my lady can't cope with things in her life, like her anger and that, she then goes back to that somatic pain. It's just so fascinating to actually see it in front of your very eyes as you're talking to people. It's just absolutely amazing oh. so yeah, yeah. So, well so one of the things that is really fascinating about um and this kind of plays into pain too but pain is not the only thing that, we're, that works this way and i'm really glad you brought up inflammation swelling right um so neuroscientifically the part of your brain that does do a lot of the emotional processing and it's not specific to one or a couple it's really like all of your emotional processing and like how that's used for prediction um, is your 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 ventromotor um, um, ventromotor region, um, and that is really tied in tightly to interception, which I already mentioned, but also your immune system. So it's meant to like really dispatch quickly all of your armies that you have in your body. So your fight or flight in your autonomic nervous system. Um, you know, interoceptive sensations coming from your body and your immune response. So if she's having something that's emotionally associated with some kind of immune response, if she learns at a young age that that immune response is tied to some kind of emotional state, but she did it totally unconsciously, these are all very unconscious processes. Absolutely. Her body can make that swelling happen because your immune response, that inflammatory response is one of those soldiers. So it's really tied in to emotional state, which is why we also have a lot of inflammation when we're stressed and you have like a very high, like a, a lifestyle with a lot of threat, kind of threat sensitivity or anxiety. I think it's really interesting too, because so she's having twins, you tie into your attachment, right? Her mom's not as available to her, right? And, and probably never was again quite the same way. And so all of those kinds of feelings of, needing comfort and needing somebody and feeling like they're not there or feeling like there's nobody coming in to help save the day for you probably are tied very much to an oddly specific set of of these immune responses because that it's all built in into her brain like that that is an emotion for her it doesn't really have probably a very good name for her but for her like that that feeling of of needing comfort or needing support and not having it Yes. is it's something that's very strong very in her strong. brain yeah. and it's it's setting off enough to set off an immune response in the same way that you know perhaps another stressor might but yeah, yeah attachment's big because um especially in childhood and you know that's a great example that's a really interesting example where you know and she'd be fully again there's no reason why she would question that it would be automatic it's all automatic that's and right. You see, that's life. that self-reflection thing comes in. Yeah. The inability to reflect. You said, you know, I found the trauma, but she still can't connect. Now you were saying about um, what were you suggesting was was good for that? So meditation you know, or something. Met, yeah, having somebody okay. help you with reflecting because you know. So I'm curious when she came to you, um, how abnormal like how long did it take for her to realize that that was like a fairly abnormal response to stress did she, did uh, she have a sense that other people would have that when they were stressed or no no 
No. no. So she, she went to, she's been to all the doctors. So she thought something referred, was. Yeah. And physical. one of the doctors referred it to me. You know, one of these okay. notable doctors referred it to me. So that's how okay. I got it because they all, they'd given up on her, I suppose. Well, there's no structural explanation, so they wouldn't have a whole lot to offer her. But, okay, so she, well, what she has then is is likely two things. She's not realizing that they're connected. So she doesn't No, not yet, happening. because I have to keep yeah. scaffolding her, because I have yeah. to build her inner confidence to be able yeah. to self-reflect, because at the moment, if she self-reflects now, she'll become disrupted again. Yeah. So all I've done is just made general, you know, movements in that direction. Yeah, but, gradu kind of yeah, gradual exposure. Yeah, gradual um, exposure yeah. and reframing yeah. it so that she can see, so she can get that little gap between the immediate response or the immediate reaction and have that microsecond to actually see that she's having a reaction. So that's what I, yeah. I do in ISTDP so that they can actually gather their whole, you know, there's a therapy called parts therapy and actually ISTDP does that very well because that's what we do. We, we gather all the broken pieces, gather them together so that we've got a whole person and then that whole person can reflect on how angry they are or how sad they are or how joyous they are. But at the moment, she can't do any of those things because that fear of her, of her symptoms are so massive and it's completely, absolutely the same, identical, to what she would have felt as a two-year-old when her mother couldn't help her. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, so what I would yeah. say too is it's not even that it's the connection is normalized for her. I would say it maybe it's a slightly different situation for her where she's mis, uh, you know, misattributing this response because her cultural norm is that if I'm swollen, there's a physical problem, right? And that's American. We are medicalized to sex, right? Uh, I think most countries are pretty medicalized. So I am Absolutely. having swelling. I have a physical problem. You see it in pain obviously all the time i i'm having pain there's a physical problem unfortunately that is oftentimes reinforced by medical professionals who don't have a lot of neuroscience training um right back herniation or herniated discs are a really great example of this where is a herniated disc abnormal sure i guess it's a, it's a normal sign of aging and for years we thought it caused pain and then we thought let's do some mris on healthy people with no pain and Lo and behold, they have the same number of herniated discs as people with back pain. Oops, um, we forgot about the control group on that one for a while. But, um, you know, when you've had that reinforced, instead of thinking like, this is part of my emotional response, you're thinking, this is a separate thing. So like, this is, oh, my stress is here, my pain is here, or my, you know, symptoms are and here. And they can't, they can't, they can't it. integrate. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. for a lot of people, it's hard too, because they don't understand that your emotions are not separate from your physical body, right? Again, not everyone has the benefit of like laying back like me, eating grapes on a pillow and reading neuroscience studies all day long, right? <laughs> um, that's a privilege that I have. <laughs> we, can, we can understand, and Rose taught me a lot about this, that also um, anxiety causes pain. Like anxiety is yeah. pain underneath it, and you know. Sure, so well, that's, I know that's exactly in the hospital. You take someone, uh, the ambulance comes, the pain's going to be, yes. Yeah. You know, I've, oh, yeah. I I remember stopping in at a motor car accident once and I had, there was an unconscious guy on the ground. So I, I realised I could roll him. So I rolled him and I kept his earway open. But then when, when he became conscious, he became really agitated. When the ambulance came, he was absolutely agitated. And yet in a calm position, quietly, just breathing, he was okay. As soon as the ambulance shows up, yeah. You go you go into ED and you see a child, emergency department, and you, you'll see a child come in and they've got a, a bad cut or whatever and they're not crying, they're not anything. As soon as the doctor with their white coat shows up, they go into panic mode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I want to uh, chat for a yeah. minute about, um, about, you know, Again, I, I've i just seen so much in the past couple of years with these shows because I've been doing them in Israel as well and seen so much healing from people, whether it's autoimmune disease or cancer or just back pain or disc problems. So, so even when someone has a structural problem, a spinal stenosis or a spondylolisthesis, you know, or 
a, a, you know, a war injury or PTD. Like, it, I, I'd like to say on the record that even with that kind of chronic pain from a structural problem, it, there are many people who don't have chronic pain with these structural problems, and many do. And I, I believe those people who come into my door or Rose's door, we can help them with PRT training or meditation or seeing their anxiety with their pain, seeing their relationship with the pain. And in that way, they can live a functional quality life. So yeah. we're not just talking about, of course, acute pain gets better. But when people have chronic pain from these medical things, they can improve with this work. I'd like to just say that on the record and get your opinion about that. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, the reason we want to always rule out structural causes is to make sure it's not something we can fix, right? Or something that's going to progressively get worse without some kind of treatment. But as far as the pain, again, the nociception from those injuries um, is separate from your pain. So everybody's pain response, again, it, it behaves very much like an emotional response. You don't feel happy the same way every time. You don't feel angry the same time. And you don't have to feel pain the same way every time. And most people with a, a long-term chronic injury will tell you their pain's not consistently exactly the same all the time. It'll come and go over time. Um, even whenever there's a structural kind of thing happening, needling it along, right? Um, and so... I think understanding that and kind of what I find really interesting and you see it in therapies that have um, like somatic tracking, right? Alan Gordon uses somatic tracking and a lot of folks do this where you try and come up with um, more objective words to describe what you're feeling if you can. So instead of saying this is painful or bad or it hurts, you think like this is uh, feels like pressure or this, you know, kind of feels um, like a, like a burning or this feels warm. Or sensation. It feels like sensation is different than pain. Sensation, sensation is different yeah. than pain. And so okay. if you can start to understand it. But it's the same it thing, list. though. It's the same but, thing, though. But your language about it comes Your language is different. That's right. Your language will you change your, so it changes that affective state. Yeah. You're and reframing so it'll it. change that. You reframe yeah. it. Exactly. Yes. And it'll yeah. change that affective state. And since the pain response itself is very affective and driven by those affective feelings, like your other emotions are, then it will help to kind of change that feeling of pain for you. And so you you still might not be able to get pain relief, like some people who have neuroplastic. Oh. Oh. You back. may have different things, but you can at least take a lot of you know, the edge off of pain, especially if you can take away the fear of it, the anxiety around it, and sort of reduce that affective intensity around it it'll reduce the intensity of the emotional response too. And so, so pain re, will behave a lot like it. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so reframing will kind of change that. Yeah. Talk about yeah. when people have their legs taken off because ah. they've got, um, I love that one. Yeah. Phantom you know, they've got diabetes, for example, which is, is a, an emotion-based disease anyway. Yeah, and then lot, yeah. they're, vascular system breaks down and they get necrosis in their toes so they'd get one toe taken off and then half the foot taken off and then the next time they come into the hospital they have the whole leg taken off yeah talk about that so that people can see how we actually our minds predict how bad it is i think it's a very yeah. good example of just how intense and how powerful the brain is it's not so powerful until we start noticing it, we, we're helpless, really. It's like having a supercomputer in our heads. So just talk about that a minute so people yeah, can sort of get the gist of what what is actually happening. Actually, phantom limb pain is one of the, the best metaphors to describe predictive brain processing that there is. So yeah, um, it, it happens in tons of cases, many, many, many cases of, of amputations for whatever reason, whether it's diabetic or an injury, um, you see it in veterans all the time. It's been around for years. We're very familiar with it. And it's a pain condition. Um, and it's not always pain. Sometimes it's itching or it's a sensation that you get from a limb you literally do not have anymore. It is not there anymore. And there's nothing more concrete and in your face, as far as evidence goes, as my arm can't hurt, it is gone. Or my arm can't itch, it is gone. But that does not make the pain go away. Knowing that it's gone is not enough to reverse 
that prediction of something is happening. So if you had a trigger or something that went on or your body has any of these somatic triggers, it can set off the pain that you may have felt whenever you lost the limb. Or it could be a new pain or an itch or whatever it may be. The only way we can treat phantom limb pain, well, maybe not the only way, but the most effective way by far is something called mirror therapy, where it's you have to go beyond. We always overestimate. We think our prefrontal cortex, our like logic thinking brains are so powerful. They're not at all. They have like no say in your brain at all. They're cute. They're like a neat decoration, but they really don't do anything for these automated processes. But what does do it is if you have somebody sit with a mirror so they can see themselves and it reflects the other limb bilaterally over so they can see it and it looks like their limb is there. And if you have an itch, if you scratch this arm, but it looks like you're scratching this one, it will help give you relief if you must oh my god arm, i don't understand that you just pain. like whoa because your your predictive systems are very much in control of a lot of your sensation and perception even more so than your own obvious like your logic um yeah it's so phantom limb pain is a great example and what they're using now um is virtual reality versions of me that's therapy. right yes and you can yeah, do you it in virtual the reality yeah. Yeah. So you can see that way if you don't have like a bilateral injury and it's it's harder to do mirror therapy now with VR, you can. And you do essentially like a kind of a gradual exposure so that you can gradually retrain your brain that it's fine, that you're good, that it's not there. But in the meantime, yeah, it gives you it gives you relief. It is the strangest phenomenon, but it is one of the best ways. It's one of the best pieces of evidence we have that the brain predicts more than it reacts because we can actually have pain in a place we don't even have anymore that doesn't exist anymore Bethany, and that's what yeah sorry where in yeah. the brain does this happen where in the brain can yeah. you talk about the neocortex the midbrain yeah. the hindbrain can you just sort of for those people that are sort of remember that our tms people are into all this research so please you know yeah. because from from my percep perception it's the hindbrain it's the reptilian brain where the emotions are, arise so they so it's, arise it's very actually early. It's in your it's in your limbic system is what we call it which is a yeah. bit more of like your midbrain um and so you know there's it doesn't have a specific center our emotions are again um so our, our our brains just have these massive networks and things come in from all directions and sometimes they're duplicative um that's by nature right because if you have an injury you want to make sure that you have other things doing similar jobs. So you have stuff coming in from multiple places. You can have like multiple areas. Um, but as I mentioned before, so the part where a lot of this is processed, so there's a part of your brain called the visceral motor region. It's part of kind of like your limbic midbrain system. And it's where things like your amygdala um, and a lot of those sorts of, of regions that folks might be more familiar with. And it's where a lot of your sort of emotional concepts are triggered from, right? Um, concepts themselves are, I guess you could say in a simple way, are, are stored um, in your, what's called your default mode network, which is sort of like how your brain just sort of works and moves and is all of your core beliefs, your sense of self, kind of your whole library of what is life kind of resides in that default mode network. It's actually a really cool part of the brain. But um, this visceral motor region, is it's where we have our emotions. It's also where a lot of the pain processing areas are. Um, they're tied in very strongly though, Rose, to what you would call like the hind brain or the base brain. Things like your, um, you know, your hypothalamus and things that will set off um, your automatic systems in your yeah. body. So yeah. it's, it's very, a, it's very like, it's like your breathing. People. You can yes. control it, but it's always going. So it's always going and it's highly affected by your emotions. When yes. you're when you have high affect, you tend to be breathing a lot. When you have low affect, you tend to be breathing more calmly. And what's cool about breath is that, like you said, you can control the breathing. And since it's bi-directional, your brain works both ways. So <clears throat> your emotions send signals to how you should breathe, but how you're breathing sends signals to your emotions. Wow. So you get cued both ways. So that's what's really interesting about this part of the brain and so since it's so tied in 
It's very tied into your autonomic nervous system, your breathing, your life support. It's very tied into your interception, how your body is feeling, your, your sense of is, Can it change? Can, it, can we neuroplastic? Can we change it yes. through? You can change these connections quite a bit. So, um, and it's also tied into your immune system, which goes back to the, the story that Rose had with the swelling. Yes, all of the things in your brain, for the most part, have the potential to be changed a bit. Anything that's kind of neurally connected, for the most part, you, can, you can't you can completely sever a connection, but you can change the intensity to which it goes. That intensity, that power goes back, and I think I mentioned earlier, that's how automatic something might be, right? If it's a very powerful, powerful connection, it's very strong and fast, you have a lot of neural systems that are supporting it, it's going to be very automatic, and it's not going to really even register up here. This part of your brain is somewhat di distanced from the other ones. You can be conscious of how you feel, but you have to turn that on and it takes a lot of energy. And so your brain is amazing, but it is lazy and it does not like to use a lot of energy if it doesn't have to. So engaging this is oftentimes kind of like a last resort. Um, but yeah, all this stuff in the midbrain is very, very automatic. And the point of it, again, is to predict what's going to happen in the future based on what you're getting all the time. It's always taking this stuff in and predicting, predicting, predicting. And the only thing that will stop that prediction circuit is being like, oops, I'm wrong, which is like something we generally experience. As so is, is that the neocortex coming in? So That's that I one- to, I want to bring that, was, that in now into yes. this story. The neocortex- It can be yes. awareness, it, consciousness. Yes. 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 Because what so, happens is your sensory systems bring in data so let's say you're out in the woods and you see a twig on the ground, but you're nervous and you've seen snakes in the woods and you're afraid of snakes. You see that twig, what do you see first? You see a snake and you ah, you jump and you startle and you get ready to run away, but you, you kind of keep looking at it and eventually your sensory systems tell you that's not a snake, that is a stick on the ground. So you have to have that conscious shifting of concepts. You have to know what a stick is, how it's different than a snake, and that you didn't actually see a snake and that you're okay. So you can calm yourself down with that, but you need that knowledge. So if a patient doesn't know that they don't have an injury, that it's not a snake, right? If, if you don't have that knowledge that that stick is not a snake, if it still looks like a snake, you're not gonna calm down. <laughs> you're, that's gonna reinforce. It's gonna keep reinforcing, this is a dangerous place in the woods. You're going to see more snake-like sticks. It's just going to become more likely and stronger and stronger. Um, so when you have these pain issues, you know, if you think something's going to happen, it, it will. It'll reinforce itself. And unless you have the knowledge of, like, this is not dangerous, I am not in danger, my body is not in harm, you're not going to stop having sure. that belief yeah. that, that because no you can't, is happening. Yeah, because you can't connect to your neocortex. Right. The anxiety yeah. comes up so high, the amygdala becomes activated, yes? And then mm -hmm. the neocortex, can you describe how it's cut off? You know, we had this amazing, amazing film producer from Israel who mm -hmm. um, who had... Um, uh, Yonatan um, who did docu docu-therapy with the dolphin boy? Yes. No, what happened was he actually, an uh, IUD went off, and okay. he had one of those detectors, and he didn't get the he didn't find that IUD, so he blamed himself. So then, all the time, afterwards, he had the leg pain. He got the leg. Right. Off. This was um yeah. This was um. It, um it's a different one. It's not. Yeah. The it was. It was board. about. It's called um. Oh, I forget the name, but it was a war injury, and he 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 the tank yeah. blew up, and he felt yeah. responsible. So he had leg That's pain. Not for many years yes. and then he wanted the leg to get cut off. Yes. So what was happening That's to him it. was he was not able to connect to his neocortex. Yeah. This is what I'm getting clarified yeah. with you. He wasn't yeah. able to connect to his neocortex yeah. to actually see that it wasn't his fault. Right. That that the IUD yeah. detector thing, he wasn't able to find it because I think he had a dog and the IUD. It was called cut so, the pain, cut the pain. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so what I'm talking about is the fact that when the anxiety is so high, the patient can't actually self-reflect. And self-reflection comes from neocortex, yes? Oh, wow. Yes. That is yeah. a metacognitive 
trait. It's yes. a very newly adapted trait for sure. Yes. And those yes. tend to not be part of our emergency systems. So that's if you're right. in a state of emergency, those are kind of extra. So it's not that they're literally cut off. Everything in your brain is connected. So I don't want to give people the wrong impression. You don't have a wall or anything like that. No, no, no. But, but, uh, it, it, but it is like a wall because they can only go to fight or flight or freeze or fawn. Well, it's it's, it's well. energy heavy, right? Like yes. it's kind of like if your phone's about ready to run out of battery, it'll go on low battery mode to save power. When you're in an emergency situation, your brain is going to stick to things that it needs for survival. And we really haven't been metacognitive long enough, you know, we've been obviously humans for a long time, but that's not really integrated into our survival the same way as meaning to breathe and run and not be eaten <laughs> and all of those kinds of basic survival things. So it tends to not get priority for energy usage. And so it kind of shuts down a bit. It's it goes into sleep mode. It's not that it's oh, gone wonderful. or taken what a out. Way of describing it. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's an that's an extra feature that you kind of don't need right now and you need to get to the thing. The problem happens and kind of getting back to the trauma issue, when you've been traumatized, depending on how your brain responds to that trauma, it can really generalize what environmental cues then you start to associate with that panicky feeling of being in immediate danger. Some people really generalize a lot and they almost have this constant sense of anxiety and fear. Some people tie it to very specific things, but when they see those things, they're incredibly powerful. And so trauma makes that, that anxiety response really sensitive, much more likely than other people to go off. So when you have a history of trauma, it's really difficult too for you to self-reflect because your brain is going into sleep mode much more often because you're, you're constantly, you're, you're, your emotional brain and your survival brain are constantly convinced that, okay, I'll deal with that later, but right now I'm in a life-threatening emergency. And you can't just say, oh, hey, my conscious brain tells me I'm not in a life. You can't just tell somebody you're not in a life-threatening emergency. It's very difficult. They have to believe that. It has to resonate. It has to get to their emotional core in order for that to really close off and shut down. They need evidence that not only you see but that they see and that they respond to. That's right. Yeah. So it's a very visceral state. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it happens with all of us. But again, with trauma, that sleep mode happens much, much more often because you're you're going into survival mode much, much more often. Uh -huh. So you're um, that does come from a lot of it comes from the amygdala, which essentially is the part of your brain that does a lot of threat detection, uncertainty detection. And it, if you have really powerful connections from your amygdala to other parts of your brain, that threat can automatically set off a lot of physical responses in your body. So of course it already sets off increased heart rate and increased blood flow and increased respiration because we're literally getting ready to fight or run, right? Um, or freeze. Uh, but it can also, again, set off pain. It can set off um, other things that you associate with different emotional kind of concepts. So it can be very strongly tied to things like your anger or sadness or guilt, you know, things like that. And it, it's all, again, very bi-directional. So you can feel those things in your body. Let's say you have a, too many cups of coffee and you chemically induce those feelings in your body. Somebody with trauma history will think that they're in danger. They'll associate those feelings and they'll actually look for threats and assign them to things in their environment because they haven't thought about the fact that, oh, it's maybe my coffee and I'm just highly caffeinated. But sometimes we'll actually feel those feelings and associate them out to something and say like, that thing's dangerous. And that's a really interesting one too. There's um, an interesting paper that talks about police officers and tired police officers who are re like relying on things like caffeine to stay awake are much more likely to make inappropriate threat assessments like of danger when danger is not there wow. when they're on the job. So yeah. it, it, you don't do it again. You don't do it consciously. You just think, Oh, I'm really worked up. Oh, it's because of that. That thing is dangerous. And it's made me worked up when really you had a cup of coffee and <laughs> you're accidentally attributing it to the wrong thing. So our attribution system for that is not always the best. <laughs> you know, we, we do a lot of causation and correlation is the real answer. You know, a lot of our patients, Bethany, have problems with sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Would you? Yeah. How much research is there has there been done on dream, dream situations? Oh. Often patients will wake up, and as soon as they wake, they have their back pain back. They've gone to sleep mm -hmm. at night. They're fully rested for whatever, 
and they wake up with back pain. So it's, I know it's the predictive text happening, but what happens during sleep that these things aren't integrated? Because usually, if you think about it, you need to make an important decision and you step back and you say, I'll, I'll sleep on it and then I'll see what I decide in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to use that model now as to why a person will wake up with their back pain, their leg pain, their headache, whatever. What What's going on in that night, during that night time with their REM, I can't even think of the names of the, of the different sleep cycles now. Sure. What's happening within the sleep cycles that this integration isn't happening? There's a couple of things that could be happening. So in a healthy person, let me start with that. Usually when you're sleeping, it kind of gives you the reset, the refresh that you need. Your brain comes back working at all cylinders. And a lot of times the threat or whatever was happening, the stress of the previous day, it's kind of washed down your, your high energy, you're feeling good. And a lot of that kind of feeling of threat uh, can be reduced, right? In a healthy situation. Um, so a lot, you just feel better. You feel rested, you feel yeah. ready to go, you feel fresh, right? Now, if you, um, when you do that, you tend to be, depending on how much of a morning person I suppose you are, <laughs> you know, affectively, that sets the stage for not having super intense emotional responses to things right away, right? So you're, you're more, you know, less likely to have kind of a very emotional reaction to something earlier when you're rested, I should say, uh, than if you're tired which we know that, right? You get grumpy and tired and grouchy and you react and you feel bad the next day when you calm down. Now, certain things can be happening with people who, you know, are thinking, well, I should wake up and feel better then. Well, not necessarily. One, you maybe didn't get as good of sleep as you thought and you might not be as rested as you think. That's a very possible situation and you don't get that fresh feeling. Two is that a lot of people haven't really been able to yet fully integrate the fact that their pain is not coming from their body nociceptively. When you wake up, there is no change in the belief that something's broken in your body if you believe that something is broken in your body. It may even make it worse because you might think laying down all night exacerbates whatever you think your injury may be, even when it doesn't. Um, so that belief doesn't really change with sleep. It doesn't make a difference because that's a poor belief that you have. Right. So it's not going to be wiped away. Um, I would say that most people who are coming to, you know, they're coming to acceptance with the fact that, oh, you know, my pain might be top down. My pain might be coming from my brain and not my body. I would imagine they would probably um, be the folks who start out okay. But as the day goes on, the pain probably gets worse and it's harder to manage that. Whereas folks who wake up with pain are probably the folks who are less likely to have bought into the idea that their pain is not structural in nature. Uh, it's not going to be a hundred percent. Of course, everybody's very different, but I, I would say that that pattern would probably be more common. Um, but yeah, cause you know, sleep, it's going to bring down that affective intensity. And if you realize your pain is kind of emotional in nature or brain based in nature, however, somebody might want to think about it, that will help you. Um, but if you don't believe that, if you're not in that place, it doesn't really change a whole lot for you. And depending yeah. upon your belief system, it could make it worse. So wow. yeah. it, you know, it kind of just depends. And there's also sensations that you get, right? Um, I'm a person that thankfully does not have to deal with chronic pain every day, but I am a person that if I sleep funny on you know, my neck or my shoulder, it feels wrong until it loosens back up. Um, but that, odd feeling for me, I normalize as being like, I'm fine. I'm not afraid. I don't have any threat with that. But somebody who has a history of chronic pain, a, a change in that interoceptive sensation from normal is enough to trigger, oh my God, I hurt myself. Something's wrong with my neck. I've hurt my neck. Something's wrong. And they'll feel pain all day. And it could, that could be enough to set off pain. For, right. a long for time. six or seven hours, you're inactive, your muscles are tightened. The less blood and oxygen, you're lying in one position, you get up, you're going to be sore, a little ache, you get up, you deal with gravity, and you you expect to just loosen up. But if you're this, like, what's wrong with me, like, then becomes a pattern yeah. relating to your morning body, and then it becomes, so we're back to the pain and the and the, the patterns, you know, yeah. of, of relating to pain and fear. Yeah. 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 We well, see, when, when, when we... Yeah. Ahead, when we bro. talk about it being a core belief, well, then 
it's your you've got a problem you are a problem you've got a problem you are a problem so you're going to wake up and recognize that you are a problem and then the tension because you know when people are sleeping they roll around in the bed you know you look at them one minute and they're that way and you look at them another way you go into them or whatever during the night and and you see how restless they are some of them twitching their feet all of that stuff so there's a whole lot of stuff going on when we are asleep and that's why i wondered if there had been any sort of like deep research into why people would have that sort of pain in the morning and yet other people will have a pain later on in the day when they're doing gardening so they yeah. wake up fine in the morning and then all of a sudden they're burdened i suppose by having to do gardening yeah or they're yeah. dissatisfied with the way they've done the gardening or various other dissatisfied dissatisfied dissatisfactory things are happening to them yeah absolutely well they could be even unrelated right it can kind of go back to that caffeine and threat um example you use gardening so you use your muscles so they feel different because you used them but you also had a really stressful day maybe you had a fight with your spouse or you had a really stressful day at work and that's kind of set off more of a threat and tension sense in your, you know, kind of in your fight or flight, but you're associating it because you've had a change in your muscles. You're like, oh, that must be what's making me feel this way. I'm in pain. I've hurt myself, right? Or gardening hurt me. Gardening hurts. It hurts when I garden. And like, it just takes that one or two times to believe that, especially with a history of, of making those connections between threat and pain that you've made a new one now. And that's why we see a lot of these neuroplastic pain conditions jump around because they're they're that, you know, think of it again, if we go back to the emotion, you know, what makes you happy? Well, it depends on the day, it, you know, depends on you. It depends on the thing. Things are changing all the time. Pain does the same thing. So some, some days you may notice it really just bugs you. And some days you're, no, yeah, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting but there are certain things like the guy at work that you can't stand that pretty consistently, you know, you're like, that makes me feel this. So there, there are a lot of people who will have their pet triggers that they're like, every time I do this, it makes right. me and, great. And Alan Gordon will say in one of his, um, he wrote, he wrote, he, he's in one of the books. He writes about some of his, his, his insights before his book came out. He talks about, um, what does he call it? It's it's when you label your day. Uh, I forget the name, but what does it call it? Like, it's a good day, it's a bad day, it's a good pain, it's a bad pain. You know, um, it's better to just notice, you know, what roses teach it, what to recognize, no judgment, no criticism, yeah. to self-reflect, oh, there's that pain again. But to to label our days is hurting us because then we're in a box. You know, and I'm then that a box takes a, over. A, 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 yeah, um, I forget the name of it. It's, it's anyway, but it's it's really just to step back and witness. Oh, this is what's happening. Oh, I slept. Well, you know, I slept okay. You know, and to not be attached yeah. to our reaction to our. You know, and this is. I, I'd like to. End, I, I don't. I don't want to end the show ever with you. I want to go on forever. <laughs> I would love to talk about like Rose and I had an amazing gentleman on the show. Um, I forget his name again. It's morning time for me, and I did not have my coffee. Um, but um, he spoke about the unconscious and the conscious. Marvin Scorman, All right, Toba. Marvin Scorman. He spoke about, and he's an ISCDP, an amazing therapist, social worker. Um, he knew um, Doctor um, Davin uh, Doctor Davin Lu. You know, he knew. The, so the point I'm making is that. And I speak about how sometimes we need to make our unconscious conscious and that will bring calm to our brain. So I'm believing from my knowledge that the unconscious is the body. In your scientific mind, is what do you say when you think the unconscious is a part of a part of the brain or is it the body? It's both really. I mean, a lot of, it's what we call embodied, right? And so, it happens, things can happen in your body, but we, you know, we tend to process everything. We are the, our brain kind of, you know, like we live in a body, we have these nerves, um, but as far as what happens outside of your brain is your brain's best guess of what's happening outside of your brain. Um, but I would say, when you talk about, you need to make the unconscious conscious, 
or when you talk about we need to have a non-judgmental reflection of the day or meditation, I go back to you need to stop using your concept for a second. Don't think of a bear. Pay attention to what you're seeing. Look at the fur, the teeth, the ears, the eyes. Make your brain do the work of seeing it, might be it a wolf. raw data. It might be it a might wolf. Be a wolf. It might be a wolf instead because if you think bear, your brain is like, oh, great. That's an energy saver. I see a bear, right? And it, it happens oh, all, all the time. Oh, Bethany, I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That energy so, saver. So the unconscious yes. an energy is, saver. is it can be the body or the brain. It depends. So yeah. The unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. What happens in your body? What happens in your brain? It's very hard to draw a line between those different things. Your brain is constantly processing your body at all times, and. Um, and your body is responding to your brain at all times. I mean, it's really difficult to say, oh, this is the line, right? Well, Dr. Um, Dr. Candace Pert, and she rests in peace, an amazing scientist. Um, after her studies, she says in her book, Molecule of Emotions, that the, the, uncon the, group, the body is the unconscious. So I kind of love, I like that explanation. Yeah. I, I think you have a lot of unconscious everywhere. I, but yeah, you have a lot of it. You know, it's just really, I think it's, for me, I always just think of that concept. You know, do we need to do a concept revision? I like what Rose said, you know, I'm thinking bear, so I see a bear, but it might be a wolf, you know? <laughs> it might be a sweet puppy. A shadow. You're missing out on it. <laughs> or yeah. a shadow. The stake, the, or the stick of the snake, right? I see, mm -hmm. if you think a snake, you see a snake, but it might just be a stick, and it's totally um, harmless. Um, mm -hmm. So, so our concepts are unconscious. They're automatic. We have learned them and your brain's like, I can use this to save time and energy. And your brain will always do that. <laughs> you know, like I said, it's very lazy. So, so sometimes you so have when, to click that off. So when you learn to be a neuroscientist, where does philosophy <laughs> fit into the picture? Oh God. We've been where does it not fit into the picture? A lot of philosophy today. Yeah. Well, a lot of the things that we base a lot of neuroscience that people would think of as traditional or classical neuroscience is really based on philosophy. That can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and a lot of things just really, they cross over. Even now in neuroscience, a lot of the things, the theories we're looking at have a deep tie into philosophy. So things like predictive processing of the brain or what um, Andy Clark calls embodied cognition, where you're actually thinking with your whole body, not just your brain, right? It all contributes. Um, a lot of these come from people who have a, a dual sort of expertise in neuroscience and philosophy. Uh, the idea of thinking of the system, thinking of how would this work? Why is this really breaking away from this idea that we need to take something and like break it down from the back, reverse engineer it. It's kind of gotten us into some hot water in a lot of current medical things, right? It can be great for certain things, but not good for complex things. It takes no. kind of a philosophical mind to think about, well, how does exactly. the whole thing work? Yeah. And, 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 and why would it do yeah. this? Well, you see, when, when you were, um, as you were talking before, I was thinking of those some of those philosophers that I've had to learn. I mean, I can't think of the one. I know he's a German one, but I can't remember which one it was that came to mind. I can't remember his name, but I thought, uh, um, oh, I can't even, I can't remember now. But it just, I wanted to share that with you because it's just all these, all these um, human mind issues they all come together in different ways and even theology comes into mind you know the soul sure and and what's the role of the soul in all of this so yeah absolutely yeah you can get into you know spiritual mental emotional physical but um exactly. yeah a lot yeah. of a lot of it is is very philosophical i mean we're literally it's a science of us trying to understand the science of how we think about things you know i mean it's so circular and and that's odd right that well, we that's even what do this is. <laughs> exactly was, so you know yeah. so it's paradoxical of, and it's what paradox. we're doing now in modern times is, is trying to take those philosophies and see now that we can test them with <laughs> technology are they holding up to mustard mm -hmm. some of them do some of them don't um renee descartes right he was the one that said the mind is fully oh, well, separate he was, from the body why on earth did they take that on board i wonder and they really, took that on board, and we've built our entire medical what system he, around he that. Was, he was in the movie All the Rage. What did he say, that scientist? He said that... Um, I he, think, therefore, I am. That's the crux of the matter. I uh, think, so therefore, I am. Yeah. Instead of I am and I think as a unit. Yeah. 
It wow. can be the same. Uh, yeah, everything about Descartes' theory of dualism is pretty much what we base modern biomedical science on. Yeah, and the idea our, that even our day-to-day -day thinking. Yep. Yeah, yeah, most people have been brought up on that model, and they yeah. think that there's hard science. You know, oh well, there's a blood-brain barrier. So you know, the brain is so separate from the body. It's like no, no, not at I all. You have a most, nervous I think most system. Most scientists <laughs> are coming from. Most scientists are coming from this deep desire to want it like this emotional desire to want to learn something and make like it's it's very very sensitive profession scientists yes. i like yeah, that very very much. You, you well really there's a lot of deduction and we have to be careful with that you don't want to be too simplistic and not everything is deductive like i said so you can't always take the end point and try and break it down into its basic points that's what we were doing with emotions for years well, we know anger exists, so let's break anger down into all of its ingredients and fingerprints. That's not how anger works. That's not how any emotions work. So the opposite of that is more of a constructivist approach where we say, here's how our brain works, <laughs> and here's how our body works in just general ways. Where would emotions come from? What purpose would they serve in this system, in this network? And that's what the constructivist view is. And kind of, again, Lisa Feldman Barrett, another throw up because I'm a huge fangirl, but um, <laughs> you know, that's where this idea comes from. We, we flipped it on its head from deduction to construction. And it, oh, it's really more of a name. systems thing. I want that woman's name again. Lisa? Lisa Feldman Barrett, B-A-R-R-E-T-T. -T. I want to say one, I want to say one very important thing. Two R's, B-A-R-R-E-T. -R mm -hmm. Two R's, two T's. Okay. The, the, um, you know, you can't, you, the body is an art. Yeah. How can you study, how can you study an art? How can an art be studied? Slowly <laughs> and often incorrectly, but we just keep <laughs> fixing our mistakes when we can. <laughs> it's not a mistake, it's, it's an evolution. It's like, it's like it's an embodiment. No, it's fascinating. And I, I, I decided with, I decided, and I know Rose will agree with me, um, that we're going to have you on as like our every six month scientist, like TMS <laughs> roundtable scientist hour. Yeah, Rose, it'll be so much fun to have you <laughs> me on a regular basis and get all because there's so much with Rose's work that I'm I would love to apply into the science and so much of what I do with the mind, with the body and the bones and the structure to really see that it's such an art. It's, it's very art. it's very beautiful when you start to see it. It's I think of it as a symphony all the time, but. It I have one definitely. quick question. Yes. yes. Rose. Yes. Do you have a better sense of what I mean when I say pain is an emotion now? Or have I left you dissatisfied? No, no, no. I'm fine with it. <laughs> I'm fine with it. What, what, I, what I wanted you to do was to draw it out. I wanted yeah. to be active. Because yeah. we can say these things, but we've got to actually bring them out so that whoever's listening and watching us can actually get an idea of where you come from. Because, sure. you know, this sort of nebulous thing of just making a statement without any, um, you know, concrete sort of thing. Because remember our brain, and especially if we're in that mode of intellectualising, we want to know why, where, when, how. Yes. And Absolutely. most of our patients are inter intellectualised because they spend heaps of time, Schubiner, Schechter, Hanscom, Who's, who's that? Gordon. Hi. Like they've got all these notables. So, I mean, they're going to be watching and listening and absorbing everything from these notables. So I, I like to actually make sure that, that we, when we talk, that we actually have something for them that's sort of like able, they're able to reach because they're exploring, exploring, exploring. And Absolutely. then, of course, with all that exploration, they feel hopeless. Some of them get it, and they're the people that don't have that early trauma, as far as I know. But if they've had deep trauma, they can't integrate it. And I think I told you last time I was reading some research on on myelin and how mm -hmm. myelin is thicker for yeah. people that have got early trauma. I thought, nice. how interesting. Those were, yeah. And that's when I was talking about the strength, right, of those neural pathways between the amygdala yes. and other parts of the body when you're traumatized. The myelin is the part of that that makes that really strong and thick and powerful and fast. So yes. that's where that plays in. 
But yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Well, I'm hoping that today with this talk, I've helped people break down their concept of concepts and break down their concepts of emotion and maybe hopefully start to reform how you, you know, most yes. people even think of emotions because it's actually very different than most of us have been taught. So the film Inside Out is cute, but it's not accurate. <laughs> you don't have six emotions that sit around in your brain and wait to be activated Waiting for, all yeah. the time. <laughs> but, how, but how do we conceptualize that? On a day-to-day -day basis, I mean that's sort of how it is, isn't it? Yeah. Your emotions? No, the, you to conceptualize, conceptualize it? it in a movie, like a Disney oh, movie. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, of course, it made an adorable movie, and it did teach like some things about emotional regulation, right, and, and feelings. But yeah, in, in reality, you know, you're really just creating those characters every time, and every time they look different, and every time they're brought about by different circumstances, and they yes. might do different things. So. It would be like if each of those characters was just like reinvented every time. Like they, it would be like a, a rapid Buddhism, I think, of like they were reborn over and over and over, and they're always a little different. Um, but there's still that character in your brain, right? So every time they would show joy, she might be a different color, or she might be a, be a more masculine, or she might look, you know, whatever. Um, so it's like a multiverse as opposed to a universe. <laughs> you just think of them as constantly being reborn but we still see them as the same characters in our brains because we've we've created those concepts, even though they're pretty different every time and maybe even do different things every time. Or maybe they look exactly the same, but we've decided they're two different characters. Now, Dr. Bethany Rains, <laughs> you are freelancing these days. I, I am. Yes. Could, you, could you, anyone who's interested in developing anything or anyone who's watching this program today, what tell tell the audience what you do now. Sure. Oh, yeah. I was actually just telling Dove before we got started. I'm kind of a like a nerd for hire. So uh, a lot of people what, are. What are did you just call yourself? A nerd. A, a nerd. nerd for hire. <laughs> comes from some well, kind of insecure childhood thing. <laughs> exactly. I think nerds are cool. Um, Good. But, you know, so on average, there's there's like a 20 to 25 year gap between something being like discovered in a lab and then being integrated into clinical practice. It's awful. It takes forever. And one of my biggest goals I've had in my career is shortening that gap in any way I can. And I've worked for lots of different people to do that. And I, what I've realized is that that translation piece is really hard. You need somebody who can come out of the lab and explain something in a way that makes sense and maybe apply it in a very different way and be okay with real world imperfections because nothing is ever as clean as it is in a lab, right? Have you had this so, client? Of what? Defiance in the medical profession. Defiance. Defiance. Oh. I, I don't know like, the context of it if I, as far as like just defiance against change, but is it yeah. something, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of times people are very resistant to these changes. They, they It's hard and they're used to a certain mm -hmm. way. So one of the things I've really found I love to do is help people take that lab information, translate it into kind of real world English, and help them integrate it into new clinical approaches, whether they're products or new therapies or new systems, and get those integrated so that we get that time down from 20 to 25 years to like five years, you know, and 10 years, and really shorten that up so people are getting science-based things. Because especially in neuroscience, which is a field that's, you know, my experience and passion, it's rapid right now. I mean, just things are coming out of neuroscience at a rapid pace. It's really hard to keep up. And so what I do is I work with people who have a great idea or a great, you know, therapy or something that they're working on. A lot of them are clinically based, so they're practitioner based. They know it works, but they don't exactly know how it works. And they want to make sure it's as best as it possibly can be. It's really common. Or they have an idea for a therapy that they know is important, but they're not quite sure how to build it so it'll work. So my job is to come in and work with those folks and to make sure that the science makes sense. We'll review the literature together. I help them take the scientific concepts, make designs. What would that look like in the real world and help them to develop and design their therapies or improve their therapies if they already exist. And, um, and then also just sometimes just help explain these kinds of things because lots of these products and these therapies have a lot of stakeholders and not everybody has a background in science. So I can, help them kind of explain why it's important and why they think it's going to work in a way that's very Integrate the, the concept uh, in, yeah. in the real, yeah. 
I'm an integrator. Yeah. So um, a lot of times my, my type of position is called a translational scientist, where I'm not necessarily in the lab doing the basic science. I'm taking the amazing work that those scientists are doing and I'm helping make it real. And so move to the next level. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm doing these days. And I have fantastic. a lot of really phenomenal clients doing a lot of really amazing things. So I'm oh, really, fantastic. really happy with them. Wonderful. Oh, well, beautiful. Well, let us know if, right. you, if, you, if you do. Any well, time. shall we let you go to bed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Bed. I'm a night owl. <laughs> <laughs> I would never make it in Tova's. If, if you guys needed me to be here at 6 a.m., I don't know that I can hang with that, but I can do late night anytime. Okay, so we'll, have to do this. <laughs> oh, we'll do this we'll again back then. sooner than later. Although Tova had to get up at 5 a.m. Yeah, I'm you? going to go back and take a little morning nap, but then um, <laughs> all will be okay. Thank you so much. Love, love, love. And this conversation is not over yet. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to the chatter and I'm, I'm happy right. to answer any follow-up questions folks may right. have. I'm Great. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, we've got one. Yes. Yeah, oh! <laughs> Fantastic. So someone who was, I'll just show as someone who was, good work ladies, someone who has suffered a lot of trauma and battles with chronic pain. There's a lot of interesting info in this, which is super helpful. Thank you, Evie, for commenting. We're really happy. There was a bunch of people on today, and I'm really happy that somebody commented on the Facebook. And if anyone has any questions, Bethany, you are on Facebook. You have a page and you're available if they want to ask questions through i'll i'll send them to your email but yeah, you're really you're do. really like you you're probably you you do and you probably continue to be an amazing therapist as a scientist you have a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom and a lot of vision well so i'm happy for, to share whatever i can and i'm yeah. happy to answer any questions that i can folks so yeah feel Thank free to blessing our studio again and we will see you again have a wonderful evening sleep well rose have a wonderful day god bless okay. bye everyone good night bye. ladies bye it's gonna go off